Good afternoon and welcome to the first concurrent session of the day, Spicing Up Online Discussion Boards. Our presenters today are Angie Hodge Zickerman and Cindy York, faculty members at Northern Arizona University and Northern Illinois University. We also have Megan McGinnis, who is one of their PhD students. If you have any questions for the presenters during the session, please feel free to enter those directly in the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom room screen, and we will address them at the end of the talk. On that note, I'll hand it on over to our presenters. Morning, everyone. I'll wait till our slides get up. Two seconds. There you go. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we'll be talking about spicing up online discussion boards in mathematics. Um, as Marissa said, I am Angie, and I'm sure you're joined by Cindy and Megan. I just want to put a special kudos out to Megan, who inspired this idea. Um, I was getting some complaints in my um, student evaluations in my online graduate courses in terms of, you know, all I'm doing is posting, answering, posting, answering, posting, answering. And Cindy said, I have this grad student who has great ideas. And so she's kind of inspired this and it's really taken off. If you have any further ideas, please jot them down. We'd like to hear them um, as we finish up and go. And um, so here's a little bit about myself, uh, a lot of pictures. I have uh, two stepsons who are 16 and 12, and then a son who is four, who loves to build Legos, uh, go be going, be on the move, traveling, painting and then a picture of my husband at one of his bike races. So this is kind of what keeps me busy. And it makes sense that if our lives need to be spiced up that our discussion board shouldn't be quite so boring either. So here's me. <clears throat> um, I actually met Angie when we were both working on our PhDs at Purdue University. Uh, this is my, my third life. My first life, I was a fourth and fifth grade teacher. And then I worked corporate and now I teach instructional technology at Northern Illinois University. But Angie and I work a lot together with the mathematics, education, active learning, and the incorporation of technology into it. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Megan McGinnis, and um, I'm a PhD student uh, at Northern Illinois University. Um, working with Dr. York. Uh, and a little bit about me is, um, I've been in education for, I feel like forever, um, for about 30 years in multiple formats, uh, K through 12. And then I hit higher education in 20, um, in 2004. Uh, I actually am associate director of faculty development um, at Galen College of Nursing. Uh, so I got the pleasure after all this, these years of teaching to actually help other uh, faculty develop their classes. So I'm really excited about being here. And, and thank you, Angie, for mentioning and um, about spicing up these discussions because I'm really passionate about making this a dynamic experience for our students. So usually what I do is I ask my audience to think about um, a tool that's in your house. And when I do this with mathematics folks, they come up usually with a pencil, a clock. There's a tool in your house and you use it every day. And it has had pretty much the same use since its creation. And then I ask, what, you, what do you think that tool is? And so to get my audience you know, interacting with me, I let them talk about it for a couple minutes. It's not a pencil and it's not a clock. Um, and it's actually a toilet. And so think about how a toilet could be different if it had a computer chip in it. Now, many, many of you might say, well, mine already does. I have a, a bidet or I have, you know, something else fancy in my toilet. But the, th the thing we try to think about is how will the toilet act or be fundamentally different, have a fundamentally different use than it does today. Instead of just taking our waste and getting rid of it, um, what else could it do? And so sometimes my audience comes up with, well, a heated seat, knowing which magazine you wanna read and automatically pulling it out for you, um, auto cleaning. And we consider those to be better, faster, easier ideas. And it's the same thing with uh, classrooms. We don't wanna just make it better, faster, easier. We don't just wanna have a worksheet become a digital worksheet. Um, we want to fundamentally change the way education is because of what we can do now. 
So my, my response to this usually is, well, what if it takes your sample, it analyzes it, it sends the results to your doctors automatically and says, whoop, we need a follow-up appointment for you. They put it on your calendar. And so changing the role that that tool, the toilet plays. So how do we change technology? So our, a lot of what happened during COVID was we just put everything that was face-to-face -face online. And that's not necessarily the best way to do it. It helped in a remote emergency situation, but how do we keep our learners engaged and how do we keep them from getting bored on those discussion boards? So here's some questions and yes, they were in our abstract, but we want to also remind you of the questions that we're going to answer along the way. Have your online students become bored with the traditional read post response assignments in your class? Are you looking for ideas to make your discussions more exciting for both the learner and the instructor? And we're gonna share in the session some ideas on how to make those online discussion boards a little more interesting. So one thing to keep in mind is setting up clear expectations for your students. Your students have a lot of, a lot of uh, instructors and all of those instructors have their own expectations. So this setting up what you're expecting from the discussion boards is a good start. I usually say that it's a safe space to discuss in my classroom. You need to be supportive of each other. Don't attack each other. Using all caps is not good. It's yelling. So different things um, that you expect from your students. Also be clear on when and how you will join in as an instructor. I've read things that say, if the instructor participates more than 10% of the time, the students will shut down. And I've also read things that say, if you don't start responding on that discussion board, the instructor, the instructor presence just disappears and the students think they're just having a conversation with each other and it can stop being ac academic and it can stop meeting the goal, the learning goal that you as the instructor want to come from that discussion board. So make sure they know what your role is on the discussion boards. I also, I, I make sure we have really, really clear assessment guidelines. So a lot of people just say, well, just as long as they're posting, it's good enough. Well, that's not good enough for me. That's just quantity. I wanna see quality. So I, I create a rubric and I know Angie has a rubric she uses. And we wanna make the purpose of the activity clear to the students. Here's what we're expecting you to get out of this and why we're doing it. So this is the new rubric I've been using this year. Um, I would say before then I did more of a, you know, you post a few times and they're substantive. And I would like to give an example of what I meant by a substantial post. It just wasn't good enough. I felt like I was kind of repeating over and over again. Well, you need to say more, you need to say more. And this rubric seems to have helped, I would say for maybe all but one student in my class. And I feel like that one student just, you know, they are busy and they don't have a lot of time. So this sample rubric gives five points. Um, you can earn the four to five points by your initial posting indicate that the student took time thinking about the articles read and put thought into their answer. Now, notice this does say articles read, but we're gonna give you some other ideas some different videos, some other things so that articles kind of in quotes, you can modify that. There's also an and here, and contributed to the discussion with others following reflection of other posts. This is the first time I have not put a number on the posts. I've let it be more open and I've actually found more discussion, more like real engaging discussion without a number. Um, doesn't mean you can't do a number, but for me, this seems to be working for my graduate students in mathematics education. They get two to three points if they either do you have initial posts that's weak, but good contributions to the discussion. I know sometimes um, with practicing teachers, that's who I teach as people are out in the K-12 schools. Sometimes their weeks are really busy, but they still want to engage with the discussion so they can still earn half to a little more than half of the points. Or maybe they have a good initial posting. They read through the articles, they watched the, the videos or whatever your assignment was, but they didn't have time to contribute to those response posts to engage with others. So there's a way if they kind of do about half of it, they get about half the points. Zero to one points for initial post does not indicate that the student put much thought into their answer. Just a quick like, eh, yeah. That was good. Read the articles. They were good. I got something out of it. And little contribution to others. So they really don't do a whole lot in either area. They may have done something, but not much. So it gives a nice range and scale in term versus just do give me one post and two response posts, which I used to do. And I I've used this. Angie just said she uses this with grad students. Have you done this with undergrads? I'm 
I have not. I've not done okay. this with undergrads okay. yet. So the next rubric is one that I use, and uh, I have used it with undergraduate students, uh, but I tweak them for every every level that I'm that I'm using them with. So keep that in mind. You got to make it. Um, for whatever level you're teaching, make sure that they understand what all of this all of this means. And so you might tweak the vocabulary or or other things. And it, again, it all always depends on what the the makeup of that discussion board is, how they how you can use it. Um, so these are just a couple of examples. I do, and Angie said she did too. We give students examples of those words that we're using in the rubric. And I have a really, really long rubric. If you wanna see it um, later, you can always send me an email that gives examples of all of this. Um, and it seems to be helpful. And I'm not sure if my students read it. I read it. So, you know, it's tricky because we don't really know what the students are doing. This is one of my examples that I give to them. So what does significant mean? And so the concrete examples, you know, consequences, implications. So just giving them um, definitions of those words, those terms that you use, and examples of what those mean. And I also give them examples after I, I tell them all of this. So when you're doing your discussion board, you also have to figure out your setup of it. So do I allow them to edit their post? Do I allow them to delete a post? Um, do you hide all the other responses on the discussion board until they post? And I've, I've had to say, and if you put a period or some random word and post and then edit it, I will know and I will deduct points because some of them wanna to try to get around that. They wanna see what everybody else wrote first. And is that critical? Is that important? So, um, make sure that they understand what the setup is. Can they attach files and photos and pictures? And you might need a link to show them how to do that if you're going to allow them to do that or require them to do that. Megan? All right, well, you know, it's just to kind of reiterate some things that uh, were mentioned already is how important it is to really set those expectations for our students and let them know what would be a good solid post and a lot of it is modeling that behavior so these are little things that I have learned make a huge difference along the way so first is um, when I'm replying to students um, I always use their first name always so I don't do a blanket and you know Honestly, some students, I mean, they know when we just can copy and paste reply after reply. So I really want to personalize that experience. And I always start with something like, Tamika, thank you for sharing your thoughts regarding whatever she posts. So then it looks like I've read her post as well. Um, some other things I've done to kind of help get the conversation going uh, is I re will refer to another posting. And, um, you know, I just did this. Some, this morning when I was said, hey, look at what I said to Margaret above about this situation. Um, but this is an example is when I said like, David, did you see Arlene's post above about social media and body image? So again, referring to, so students know that I'm in there, I'm engaged, I'm not taking over the conversation, um, but I'm just getting them talking and looking and trying to collaborate with each other. It is so important to draw students out. So uh, because we want to model what they should be doing, um, we want to also, you know, show it like and not just say, that's an interesting point. Well, you know, what was interesting? So, um, so I'll always draw students out and say exactly that. Like, what did you like about that person's post? I see that you were, were engaged, but can we go a little bit further in this topic? in the area of mathematics, as we're looking at this, some other things that I've done too, is like like a basic algebra where I'll say, oh, that's great that we solved the equation this way, but what happens when we add another variable? What does that look like? And it's really interesting because it's a way to also scaffold it into the next um, sort of topic. Uh, so those are great, again, ways to get the conversation going. Some other things to consider in the discussion board um, for an active and engaging learning experience is to consider gamification. Um, so, I mean, we, we do have things like, you know, Kahoot and there's some Nearpod activities. You can actually embed those two into the discussion. Um, so it gives them that little flair 
you know, of that gamification. We also have scenario base. Uh, I've done this with my nursing students where I'll say a scenario of, and this is a math related, but like a patient comes into the ER with blah, 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 blah. Can somebody talk about what this patient is suffering? And, uh, and you can also do this, whether, you know, in a math twist with dimensional analysis. Um, so, and then social media inter integration. Uh, and you know this is a this is a tricky one um, with our social media. So this is an area definitely to explore because I know in some of our online formats of what that that looks like. I do know that some learning management systems have actually added an at name system where you can put the at the name and then that person gets notification because it kind of gives you like a social media flair. Um, and that's again a great way to get. The students talking. And that's really what we're looking for in this engaging experience. So when I talk about engaging, that brings up the social presence of a class. And, um, and what I have observed through my years of teaching is that uh, how important the social presence is. You know, back in the day of uh, my my high school teaching experience, it was almost like a negative thing. Like the, the students are being too social and they're too chatty. Um, but I learned at uh, when I started teaching high school, I'm like if I can just kind of change that conversation, use that chattiness for my benefit, um, I could actually get them asking more questions. Um, and that's exactly what happened. So uh, it does create that quality interaction. The more comfortable they feel, the more they're likely to share. Um, that gives them that sense of belonging. Uh, and again, that just, it, it just enhances um, the diversity of the classroom, as I mentioned later on. Um, there is research that shows that the social presence, a positive social presence, is uh, associated with student satisfaction and perceived learning. So it's not just a sense of belonging and quality interaction, but it helps also with uh, the cognitive presence of the entire class too. Um, and then, and then as you can see, like with the awareness and diversity and correlated with that cognitive presence. So it's amazing that that little bit of interaction and a lot of it can happen in our discussion prompt. Like if our discussion prompt is just kind of simple, it's going to lead itself to a very simple conversation. So it does need some creativity so we can enhance that social presence and get our students comfortable, feeling safe, and talking. I lost my mouse, sorry. <laughs> So some things is, is that I, I once when I was uh, teaching um, at a community college, um, somebody had said to me, you know, sometimes students will not show up to learn math, but they'll show up to hang out with their friends. And um, that really hit me hard because I was teaching a really developmental math course. These students were really already struggling. Um, but just like the last slide talked about the social presence and the importance, I realized that if I can get them connecting with each other, that, you know, that that connection might get them there to class. They might not be like, hey, I want to learn systems of equations or, you know, integral calculus or whatever, but hey, I want to go and show up because it is, it's that comfortable environment and I want to see my peers and learn. So that's one thing that I, I definitely learned along the way. Um, but I, this one is really huge for me that five minutes can make a big difference. I tell all uh, the faculty I work with, it's like, you'll be amazed on how five minutes can change things, the dynamics. In an on-ground class, that could be as simple as saying, how is everybody doing? I remember teaching statistics in the midst of COVID, everybody's masked up. And, and I was like, how, how are you all doing? I spent five minutes asking them. And I went individually, because there was only six people in that class, because uh, of COVID, but I said, how are you guys doing? It took five minutes, but now I had a dynamic conversation going on with the students. They felt comfortable asking questions. So when we were talking about the normal curve, they were like, okay, well, that doesn't make sense. Can you elaborate? It just, those five minutes made a difference. Uh, in an online class, sometimes like in the middle of a quarter, I will say to the students or middle of a semester and be like, okay, this is a temperature check. It's one of my prompts. I'll have a a substantial prompt, um, but then I'll have add a prompt that says something as simple as, how are you doing at the midterm point? 
how are you going to prepare for your final exam? And um, and the conversation starts. It's a it's a conversation they can have that they don't have to overthink, but it gets them talking to each other, and that makes a huge difference. And it's because a comfortable class it will foster the respect, inclusivity, critical thinking, and intellectual growth. So the more they talk, the better the learning experience is not only for our students, but it's for us as well. I don't. I'm not so afraid of getting in that discussion board because I'm like, hey, you know, we have a great conversation going. I want to see what they said overnight. So the more you can get them talking, the better. So now for the part that you really want to see, what are our favorite ideas? So there's going to be a lot of ideas here. Our presentation won't take the entire time. So if there's one you want to go back to or have questions, make a little note for yourself. Um, I know you're all muted now and you know, it's supposed to kind of be quiet now, but we do have some time for some interaction at the end, or we are going to share emails at the end also. Um, so debating pros and cons. Um, this is really nice. So I teach both um, math content courses and courses that are more reading, like equity and mathematics education, things like that. Um, whether or not algebra should be taught in schools, huge debate right now with math pathways. What does that look like? What does it mean? What math should people learn? Um, you can do this in a couple different ways. You can let the students pick their side or something that can be a little more fun is instructor assigns positions. And then you can even partway through say, okay, now switch your position. And whether or not they agree with it, if the instructor assigns it, then they don't have to, it doesn't become as personal and they still have to justify their argument and think about both sides because if they are dealing with parents, administrators, politicians, they're going to have to see both sides and be like, okay, I understand your point, but. So that debating, especially when they're assigned a position is can be really fun. Um, and that's pretty similar to that structured controversy. So allowing a safe space, if you think of Megan's like that safe classroom, hanging out with their friends, if they are do have their friends in class, I, this wouldn't be one of the first posts I would do on um, the debating or the structured controversy, but after they're in a comfortable atmosphere, like make it be an okay place. You're going to, the instructor can structure, how is that going to come out? You can even, um, have students debate. Maybe you have some mathematical answers and talk about which answer is right or wrong, or are they both, why are they both correct solution paths to what you're doing? Um, you can even do some role playing. This could be everywhere from a history of math class where they're pretending to be um, maybe arguing, thinking of calculus and who invented calculus. You could have each person assigned um, to Leibniz and Newton, and they're kind of talking about like they're be, being in that role. They, these three we put together because they're kind of similar, but they could be very different depending on you're talking mathematics, mathematics education debates, or thinking about maybe that even history of mathematics. Or role playing could be a student and some teachers as well. If you think about if you have future teachers in your classes, it's a nice way to put to be in the teacher role or the student role. Um, our next discussion is a little longer, but basically it's a jigsaw. So um, you've maybe heard that idea before. But this is really nice, um, both for readings, if you want to split them up and there's a lot to read, maybe there are videos that they're watching, or maybe it's even a mathematical topic and they're kind of doing some, some teaching of it. So student group present, groups present their discussions to the classmates, split the topics up by group, and each group is responsible to present their topic and come up with discussion questions for their classmates. So they are coming up with the questions. They have some ownership in that mathematics there. The group then facilitates the discussion and they can use any format they want and be creative. I often, when I do this, assign some points for creativity just so they do something a little different. And then it does make it more fun. It fosters that friendship if they have to, they're kind of first, maybe the first time they meet as a group, especially if it's online outside, they might be a little hesitant, but then they are like, oh, I'm now friends with these people and I can work together in all my classes with them. And so that jigsaw is a nice way to get students talking to each other, working together. Um, Students are really into memes right now. So anything related to what they are into. Um, so having them create their own meme. I would add a note on this part with the creating their own meme. Let them know whether they are going to find or create the meme. Because when I haven't assigned that, I have people who go, I've like to the internet, use all use the same picture and they put different thing, different words on it. If you're okay with that, say that but maybe they have to create, including taking their own picture and not only creating the words on the meme, but the own picture. So going back to that being clear on your expectations, 
sometimes you will learn what it means to be clear by assigning something in gradient and go, oops, I've got to change this for next year. Uh, Cindy has taught me to create a folder in your classes to be like change for next year. If not, you'll forget or you'll get busy as you're grading. You won't have time to actually change it now, but make a folder so you can go back to that and change that. Some examples, um, and I did not check these to make sure there's not any typos. Well, to, just to excuse it if there is a little typo along the way. So in no particular order, the next slides are gonna give some examples of posts that I used. I think one or two of them I left the dates, most I took them out. This is back when I did the six points for the initial post and the three points for response. So different kind of rubric than the one I share. Um, I teach a calculus class that's connections for high school teachers. So they are high school teachers preparing to teach AP Cal, getting that dual enrollment certificate, and also trying to, so trying to get the teaching of the math and then the math education in there. So this one says, discuss what it means to humanize calculus. They read an article about humanizing calculus. In this, discuss what the article says about mathematics, and also find one fun fact about history of calculus as a humanistic activity. So that's something they have to do on their own. That helps us get to know who you are. So instead of an original, hi, my name is so-and-so, I teach uh, eighth grade math, they're having to go and find something about the history of math and humanizing it that helps us get to know them as a person, as a learner. Tell us how the fun fact relates to you as a teacher, learner, and or person. You may need to search the internet to find your fun fact. So maybe they already know something, but maybe they don't. Um, this has been turned that initial, hi, my name is, into a little something a little more interesting. And they also are learning something related to mathematics. And in your, in your response, connect with your classmates. Can you relate to their fun fact? Can you add to their fun fact? Can you find something in common with at least one student? Can you find another student who you differ from, but that you might complement each other? So there's a lot of words in that second one. It's the first time I did it. Maybe in the future, I would make that a little more specific, like find one person you connect with, make it a little scavenger hunt on that. But some ideas that aren't quite perfect yet, but you can see how they can be more than introduce yourself, tell me the school you're teaching at and something you like to do for fun. And okay. Another example, again, from that 505 class that I teach. And again, this, this class is online asynchronous. We have students from all over the country um, taking this class. They have to be teaching in the K-12. Well, I should say K, um, technically they're in the seven, 16 classroom. So they could be teaching as an instructor at a community college. So be my guest. Imagine that you're teaching a calculus course, and maybe you are, because some are. Which historical features from the calculus gallery, which is an article they read, and or women in calculus, which is a website I have them go to because it's women in calculus are not pointed out in the calculus gallery. So I want to make sure it's complimented a little. Would you bring to your classroom to lead at a lesson and why? What would you expect your students to learn from these historical features? In addition, how would you have your guests convince your students that proof is a tool for learning mathematics? Please make it clear that you have read the art both articles from your post. Um, something I see right now that maybe could add is make sure to let them know if we don't already know what grade level that you do teach at. Um, why is this in here? The class that I teach is one that is a bit proof heavy. Um, so it's not just here's the calculus but it has that proof expectation in it as well. So thinking about teachers and why do we care that our teachers understand and know proof and why do our students, what does that even mean? Does it have to mean something really scary or can it just mean um, justifying your argument, making a logical sound argument in there? Okay. Um, this is a shorter one but just kind of a different idea. Um, this is from a equity and mathematics education class, also online graduate. Um, what is quantitative literacy? Create, I know I put create on that versus find, two pictures or slides that depict the meaning of quantitative literacy and quantitative reasoning. And then respond to at least two classmates commenting in particular on what you liked and didn't like and what you have questions on. I feel like this could have a little more meat to it. Um, this could be something that's like, a good start because it's a little different, but what else could we add? So if you think about that, this one, um, if you're thinking about, we have time at the end, if you have any comments and what could we add to make this just a little more spicy? So it has a little spice, but it's maybe like a two on a scale of, you know, five or six, okay? Another example, again, that has a little spice, but maybe you wanted to have more. 
create a meme that shows what equity would mean in mathematics education, post it to the equity meme discussion board. Um, one thing that I feel like needs to be or should be added is how do you, if you have the students create a meme, how would, could we get these students to interact with this versus just like, I like your meme. As Megan said, yes, as an instructor, you can be like, oh, what did you like about it? But how can we scaffold that? So again, some of these we put in here to be like, how do we make these just a little better than they are? Um, I would also make a note that even though you have the create, um, be specific on what you mean by that. Because if not, the students will get, find the one that where they're looking over the fence post and some of the students have the stools and some don't. It's the one that the students opt tend to find. So if you want them to create their own, let them know what you mean by that. Okay. Uh, what's math got to do with it is the, there's two versions of the book by Joel Bowler. You maybe have read it. Um, something that's simple that you can do with a lot of different things. And it doesn't sound too spicy, but it actually creates a lot of different, different things versus just here, answer these questions. Create a top 10 lessons learned from mathematics teachers from the first five chapters of the book and share your list with the class, be as detailed as possible. Top 10 lists or top five lists, and maybe you even have like your bottom five where you think about what are those lists, what can those lists be? So just a different way to ask a question that's not quite as boring as, what'd you like about the book? Next. Another example. Um, you may already know some of your classmates. This is another introductory one. Again, in the classes I teach, we get some people who are brand new to the program. So they don't even maybe know how to log in to your BB Learner Canvas. And then we get other students who are at the end of their program and for two years and they have their friend group. So I tried to modify a little bit, another little different way of doing that. So another introductory post, you may already know some of your classmates and some of you may be new to, some may be new to you. In this post, include a picture that illustrates you as a learner of higher level mathematics. So not just mathematics, but that higher level, that graduate level. Um, example, a picture of someone jumping up and down with excitement or a picture of someone working solo while snuggling a cat. So kind of like, how are you as a learner? Are you social? Are you, do you like to do it by yourself? Are you excited? Are you scared? Include a paragraph as to why you chose this picture, both personally, in terms of who you are, and who you are as a learner of higher level mathematics. This is probably one of the best, um, the best response posts I've had, or best discussion posts I've had in terms of responses from students. Students really opened up to this. You could find out, um, are they someone who loves to just be around their pets? Do they prefer to be surrounded by a group of people and work socially? Socially, do they like, I will work socially because I know it's good for me, but I'd much prefer to be on my own. So you might even put a picture or two, but when they explain it, um, students were really willing to share who they are and it helped me, it helped the other students, it helped them connect with each other and then find some groups to work with for the rest of the semester, okay? Discussion on graphs. Um, this one, I think this maybe even came from Megan because I haven't quite used yeah. this one yet. You know, I'm like, uh, this, this yeah. didn't come from me, but I'm going to use it in the future. Do you want to jump in on this one, Megan? Because Sure. I, thank, thank you, Angie. This is an example of something that I tried. Um, the original post was just what makes a good graphical representation of data. This is for my statistics class. Uh, once you use a pie chart, once you use a bar graph, what kind of graph do you find easier to interpret? Well, I, this conversation was just blah. And, um, you know, it, it seemed like I was getting the same answer from students. And I noticed that when I get the same answer, that is a trigger to me that I need to spice up this prompt. Um, so that's why I changed it to choose a topic of interest and find a graphical display of data on the topic of interest. And then I go on to say, you know, the different types and then share why you chose this topic and summarize the graph. What did you find interesting, confusing, and so forth? Um, it changed the dynamics of the conversation immensely. So, and then we were also learning a lot about each other. So when the students had that choice and, and those examples, Angie, that you were sharing showed that too. When the students had the choice to create or to find, it really gives us a sense of who they are as well. Um, so this is, I just wanted to show the original and then how we changed it and it made a huge difference in this class. 
Megan and Megan has done that a lot. She'll turn in things that show the original post and then how to how to change it and spice it up. So if you want some other examples, she's fantastic at, at that. That's that's kind of where this all came from because she had turned something in for a class project. And I was like, oh, can I use these? <laughs> where did you get these from? And she's like, oh, I just made them up. So yeah, creativity and in, in discussion posts uh, are really, really helpful. Whoops. And I wanted to add on that before you flip it on that graph one. Back on. Thanks, Erin. Um, so I'm going to, um, with Megan's permission, of course, try this out in my math for elementary teachers. If you're wondering where you could use this, you can use it in stats, you can use it in the you know, methods course for teachers. But I was like, oh, we our graphing section is so boring. And this isn't even a discussion post. It's just having them do something, make it their own versus just read a graph that they probably already know how to read but how do they make it more their own and more interesting? So, and they can't really cheat too. So if you think about the COVID times and what's happening with COVID times in our department, especially there has been a lot of, well, if you let them do that, can't they just Google that? And here it's like, okay, go ahead. That's what we want you to do, right? So thinking about that's okay. Now this is a cheat proof way of doing this too. Next. And then uh, just kind of a little bit of repeating some of our favorite ideas that creating a meme is part of your answer, maybe spicing a little more, an introduction post relating it to a calculus person or whatever, you're talking algebra of the past. They always say to integrate history, so a good way to do that. Um, saying which mathematician they would have as a guest speaker and why we talked about. Um, I didn't necessarily say it directly, but create, they could have them create a video or a PowerPoint. Um, I would also encourage maybe the creativity part, maybe a little commercial, maybe a, so they're not just kind of reading the PowerPoint, putting themselves to sleep, something that they could just reading what they would have written in a post. Um, also, I found very helpful is sharing a resource or video, having them search for that, and then think about a way of maybe spicing that up yourself. How could you make them sharing a resource be a little more interesting? And there's a lot of tools um, you could use. Like my students loved using Flipgrid, which is now just Flip in their, in their posts. Uh, some of them did Twitter chats. Um, when you ask them to be creative, they really are creative and you actually learn new software as a result because you know here they're making TikTok videos now. So here's what they're making for their class assignments and they're making it fun and it's a part of themselves. Um, Yellow Dig is another tool that's embedded into some of the learning management systems. See what tools are embedded, what add-ons you can use in your learning management systems and the students will let you know what works for them and what doesn't. And I wasn't using yellow dig in one of my classes. And I said, are you using yellow dig in any of your other classes? And they're like, yes, and we love it. Could you use it next time? And I'm like, sure. So, you know, ask them what it is that they want you to do to keep those discussion boards engaging. These are other ideas to try. Um, I've done a good number of these. And I present these to my students when I tell them they're gonna facilitate the online discussion about XYZ topic. So Angie's mentioned some of these, uh, but there's a lot of things you can do. Menti, Mentimeter, those do those quick polls and it'll show it as a, as a live um, interactive slide in your PowerPoint if you want. Um, just find out what the students are interested in and try it. it. And if it fails, it fails, but you know, try it, it doesn't hurt. So to create to help with creativity lately, I've been using Chat GPT. Now I call her my chat bot and she's just she's my friend now. And so I if you haven't used Chat GPT, just Google Chat GPT and it'll pop you into this artificial intelligence world and you can have a conversation with her. Now what I haven't found yet as a way to talk to her. I would love it to be audio based, but right now I type in my questions. So you can see up here, C was me. And so I said to her, I said, what can we do instead of a boring introduce yourself for a discussion board icebreaker? And this is what she came up with. So she came up with five different ideas for me, but you can ask her virtually any question you want. I gave her an abstract and said, can you make this abstract sound more fun and engaging? Can you make it sound more academic? Now your students are going to start doing this too. So they might even do that with their own discussion posts. They might say, okay, well, let's see, here's a discussion post. Let me throw it in the chat GPT and make it sound better. So you have to decide how you're going to deal with that because you won't necessarily know if they got it from chat GPT, but when you make it personal to them and you get them personally involved, 
chat GPT can't quite do that. Now she also lies. And, and I found that out. I asked her to give me some resources on uh, academic empirical research papers. And she gave me the full APA citation and it looked beautiful. I went to go find it doesn't exist. So I asked her if she was lying. She said, well, of course not. You just can't find it. So keep that in mind. Your students aren't always going to know when the chat bot is lying to them. Um, but it's, it is a fun thing to use right now. And there's other AI tools out there in addition to, to chat GPT, but it, it's fun to play with. There's some other discussion board resources um, that are a little general, how to engage uh, the online learner. It's a book. Um, I did put the links in and creating engaging discussions, also a book. And Rena and Paloff and Keith Pratt, um, you'll see Paloff and Pratt on a good number of books. They've written a lot on the topic of discussion boards and I have found it really useful over the years um, to look at some of these sources as well. They might not be math specific, but they might give you ideas that you can then turn into uh, math specific. And Megan, I know we added you a little later, so we probably should put your thing. You can email us if you want Megan's email as well. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I think my email actually works with Hodge Zuckerman now too, of keeping it simple, angie.hodge at nau.edu, cindy.york and iu.edu. And Megan, you're welcome to put yours in the chat if that's okay with you, if you're willing to share. Uh, she really was the inspiration behind us changing, or especially me being like, I'm stuck, like, what do I do? Like, and I feel like I still have quite a ways to go and a lot to learn. And hopefully if you all have ideas, I know we're about to the end of time, but if you have some ideas, feel free to email any of us and we would love to share. And Megan put her email in the chat as well. So thank you all for your time today. What questions and do you have for us? Yeah, what do you have me? I tried to answer minutes? some as they were popping up in the Q and A and I've lost my mouse again. My mouse has disappeared, so. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, we're about at that time for our Q&A session. Uh, we did have a few come into the Q&A, but feel free to drop more questions into the Q&A. We have about three more minutes here. So if you are interested in asking any questions directly, feel free to throw that on in. One question we did see pop up was what level class is the rubric for? So those rubrics you were sharing, and I know you had have multiple rubrics, but the ones that you shared, um, they were wondering what the rubric was for, what level. Uh, mine was for graduate students. I could use it for undergrad. I just have only taught the online classes to graduate students. And Cindy, did you say yours is both? Both. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be great to see some um, lower um, level rubrics as well, if anybody has any that they want to share at some point. Um, Mike posted something, a takeoff of the, which math mathematician I was a guest speaker would be to have the students describe what three persons from the field of mathematics they would invite to dinner. Does it with his accounting classes. Uh, nice. Angie, can you talk about the Calc 1 class that you teach for AP teachers and what college it's at? Um, yes. So this is a graduate course, actually. Um, it's uh, called MAT 505 at Northern Arizona University. And we have a graduate program that's fully online, fully asynchronous uh, for teachers of mathematics, uh, wanting it's a master's degree through the math department, but has some math education. So the idea is that it's, it's a little bit of real analysis, a little bit of proof, but it's a calculus, calculus connections course. So the idea is to help them prepare to teach BC and AB calculus. So we do go into a little bit of Calc 2 with the series and sequences. Um, there is math, a lot of mathematics in it. And there's also... Um, that mathematics connections to the classroom. So thinking about like, how do you teach calculus, that active learning piece, that technology integration and the technology integration to engage piece as well. And um, some deep mathematics. Yeah, but if you're interested, feel free to send me an email. I am our grad ops coordinator and can help you. Or if you need someone, have someone who needs their 18 credits to get dual enrollment, we take non-degree seeking students as well. Any other questions? Well, if you don't have questions, go play with the chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun. If you need a title for something, that's how we started getting started on it. Uh, we're like, we need title. It's not as boring. And Sydney just kept, I mean, it was, we were rolling in terms of having different ideas. <laughs> I was texting him to her and she's like, okay, stop. That's enough. <laughs> but you can, it's, it's, it's quite entertaining. It's fun. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It does look like we're out of just about at time. So thank you, Angie Hodge Zickerman, Cindy York, and Megan McGinnis for all the valuable information you shared with us today. The next concurrent session will begin at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard. You can view the chat for session meeting room links or access the conference website for a complete list of concurrent sessions and their descriptions. While accessing the conference website, don't forget to swing by the virtual exhibit hall to say hello to our Hawks team. While there, you can view a quick five minute demonstration, request your t-shirt and be entered to win a $50 hourly giveaway. Also in the spirit of St. Patrick's Day, you'll find a few golden coins throughout the conference website. Go ahead and click on the coins to be entered for a chance to win an additional raffle. We'll see you at the next session. Thanks so much again for coming. Oh, I've Thank been seeing all. those coins. I didn't know what those were for. Yay. Yeah, so fun. Awesome, <laughs> check them out. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Yellow dig.